now we've gone to the point of what was the earth like before the flood. Now we're going to talk about what was on the earth before the flood. And we believe, Billy and I both, and so, most every people, everybody I know of, that God created this, the earth before the flood to be an environment that man could use. Everything that man needed to live was here at that time. I think we had carbon, uh, we had salt, we had iron, we had flint, we had building products, we had things we could make steel from because we have a hammer back there that was made out of steel, made out of iron from before the flood. Everything was here for man to use to build everything he needed to build and all that. <clears throat> All the structures of man, even the ecosystem and all that was all geared toward man being able to survive before the flood. Mountain ranges before the flood existed. We have, these are the ones that are known right now. And I only get, there's one I haven't got on here. Probably the Alps were maybe a pre-flood range, but I don't have that on here. But we have the Ural Mountains, the Hammers Lee down in, in uh, Australia. And we have the Babertons there in South Africa, the Guiana Highlands, and then the Central Pangean Plain, which is in the United States, England, and that's the, uh, the Appalachian Mountains and the Washita Mountains. These structures were here before the flood. We're pretty, we're pretty certain about that. The Gulf of Mexico right there was probably a freshwater body. That's where we get all the freshwater okay. fish and everything that exists today came from that coastline environment. Hudson Bay was probably a freshwater environment, and maybe the Greenland, maybe the up around Greenland, and, uh, and there was probably a freshwater body too. We had to have some fresh water here because we have all these creatures today that live in fresh water. So we had to have it there. I, just, I see that this is the last chance in Pangaea for certain animals to get somewhere. And so where did the kangaroos come from? How did dinosaurs get in Australia? Only because they can't swim that far. <laughs> and so it, they were stepped over at some point before it splits apart. And it says in Genesis 10 that there's a splitting. Also, look, if Israel is about in this area, and here's Glen Rose, it's pretty flat, and they could come under here or around this way and not be having to travel over any mountains. Yeah. This is ancient Pangaea. Yeah. It's in, it's in the book. Israel is probably right in here, and we've got about 4,000 miles to travel over to Glen Rose over there. Yeah. Really, it's not too bad. The, wagon, the people in the wagon trains went uh, 3,000, 4,000 miles across the country in about four or five months. They walked. So what? There you go. In this environment. In this environment, right. And the environment before that was even better. Exactly. There was plenty of plants and water. There was plenty of plants, out. plenty of water, plenty of everything. They had everything they needed because when they were going across the United States, they had deserts to deal with and everything else. Amen. These critters right here lived around here when men were living here before the flood. Uh, theropods and seropods. Billy, you want to explain what these critters are? They left tracks also. We're talking about ichnofossils here. Well, the sauropods are the ones that have the big four legs like an elephant. <laughs> and so we see those, and these are mostly plant eaters. <coughs> and so they were the kind of, the old brontosaurus, the allosaurus, and so forth, were the sauropods. And now all these are going to die and become oil and gas someday. The theropods were the t three main two legs, like the Tyrannosaurus, Acrocanthosaurus, and all of those that you see in those type legs. A lot of these were flesh eaters, but remember, when God created everything, everything ate plants. Right. And so nobody was eating anybody up in those days. Right. And everything we eat indirectly is plants. Milk is grass juice. Beef steak is grass, changed by the, when we eat a piece of the cow. So it all goes back directly to plants, which is very important. And if God had created a cow before grass, we could say, ah, oh, there's something wrong here. But you notice he created grass before a cow. And there was perfect uh, synchronization of what had to be here first. Yep. Plants on the fourth day, people on the sixth. Now, what we, want to what we want to try to express to you people here is that everything we're talking about now is the scenario that we use to, de to develop our proposed proposition of how men and dinosaurs lived here together. We're giving you a background of how he and I were thinking about this when this all went along, okay? Here is the Delk print. This is <clears throat> probably the most significant piece of information and evidence that we have to support the fact that dinosaurs and men lived together. It's right back there. It is an actual, true fossil. It's been determined to be actual, true evidence. It came from the river. We know that. We know right where it came from. We know everything about it. It is a piece of evidence for the, uh, for the creation model. And if you go back there, there's a glare. And Dr. Ball has promised to put some lighting in there. 
That way we can see it. I see people standing right in front of me and can't see their toes and everything. But you go look <coughs> on that corner and stand a certain way, you'll see the five toes and the heel, and you see which was there first in relative dating. Which was there first? And so the human track is there, and then this Acrocanthosaurus stepped into the track. This proved it without a doubt, geologically, that men and dinosaurs lived at the same time. I want you to notice something else, too. How many of you people actually have poured concrete? Okay. Um, I'm a con I, I inspect concrete pours all the time. I, I know concrete almost backwards and forwards. I really don't want to know it that well, but I do. But now, if you pour concrete and after about three or four hours, you can walk on it like this, and you may make a footprint in it just like that, but your foot won't go all the way into it. Am I correct? It starts setting up, doesn't it? All right. After about maybe eight hours or so, then it becomes hard enough so you could walk on it and you won't make a print in it. That's right. Here we have a man's footprint that's not but maybe an inch into that rock. Tells us about how long that stuff was sitting there, doesn't it? Here we have an Acrocanthosaurus that weighs about 10, 20 times as much, and he hasn't gone a whole lot deeper into the, into the mud than this right here. Yeah. We're going to talk about this a little bit, about how this could happen in a very short period of time and not take millions of years. Where were the tracks found? Uh, down in the Paluxy River. Uh, right here on 67, right off of 67, or was it, or was it the McFall place, Dr. Ross? McFall place. McFall place, which is a short distance over here by Dinosaur World. And that was found. Now, he's talking about concrete, and Jack is an expert on this, but listen to this. Uh, that is, looks like a piece of concrete, but it's a piece of limestone with a dinosaur track in it, see? So they're stepping in this when it's soft and mud, and limey mud, and it hardens and solidifies into a rock. And that's what concrete's made out of, lime and shale and uh, uh, other ingredients. Lime and sand and stone and things like this and water. That's what makes the slime, the quick lime slime that creates the sign. The more quick lime you have in that aggregate, the, the more strength that the, the stone has. Okay, so you tell the, t the, the strength of the stone by how much, how many sacks of cement are in each one of the yards of concrete. That's something we'll talk about later on. Here's the Acrocanthosaurus. This is the diff this is a size differential between an Acrocanthosaurus and a human being. Notice how it takes about maybe 20 of those to make a one man, maybe maybe 30, something like that. About 30 times heavier than a man. You can see the side differential. See how big the man's foot is compared to how big the Acrocanthosaurus foot is. It just about matches this <coughs> differential right here. Looks about the same. So we're on pretty safe ground to, to say that the delt print is actually very authentic, authentically produced, authentically in the place that we found it, and authentically a fossil. We see those years ago when I bring my students down here, there was, <coughs> we found a series of tracks where big dinosaur and little dinosaur came together. Looked like there was a scuffle, and then only one the big dinosaur tracks left. So I used to show that to students, and we said, well, no, they probably ate that little dinosaur. But they had some nice, soft-hearted girls in there, and they said, no, that was its mother, and she came and picked him up and carried him home. They did not want that dinosaur to be eaten. Isn't that, isn't that sweet? Before the flood, that wouldn't have happened. There wouldn't have been a dinosaur eating a dinosaur. So I think the girl had the right idea.